And it's Colossians 2, 6 through 15. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human condition, tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the spiritual circumcision, by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he forgave all our trespasses erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them. The word of the Lord. Okay, Kit, now as we uh, move through our uh, Discovery Bible study, let's have somebody read this for us again so we could hear it one more time in another voice. Anybody feel up to that? Scott, thank you. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision, by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. He set this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Great, thank you. Um, does, it, does anybody want to give us a little synopsis? So, yeah, Scott wants to do that. <laughs> Way to go, Karen. <laughs> I, I think uh, the summary is in him. Everything is in, in him, that, and it's pointing to Christ. Uh, in him, we've been raised from the dead. In him, all, uh, all our things uh, have been nailed to the cross because of him. And in him, all uh, the full mirror image of God rests in him, and somehow we have that fullness in us. Yeah, good, thanks. That's great. Thanks, God. Uh, what, what in this passage was of interest to you, that captured your attention. There's a lot in here, uh, a lot of good theology. What captured your attention in here? Amy, you want to give us something? I just, I just underlined part of it. Um, it's down towards the bottom. Um, God made you alive together with him when he forgave us all our trespasses. So that's, that's a 
something. And then it's curious later on, it says, um, erasing the record that stood against us. Now you could end the sentence there, okay? But then he says, with its legal demands. And that's like, okay, what does that mean? Yeah. Anyway. What do you think that means? Uh, well, if you compare it to Judaism, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and all of the actions you had to try to redeem yourself with the law, you know, and following that. And uh but now that's not required. Thinking about col colossi or colossi and what was going on at the time there, do you think there may have been something else that Paul was worried about that may have been putting other demands? on these new Christians besides just what the Jewish law might say? Anybody have any thoughts about that? Do you know what's going on in Colossae at this time? It's, um, well, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a Gentile city, you know, it's full of pagans. Um, there are, uh, there's a cult of angels, they call it there. Uh, Saint, uh, the angel Michael was a big part of that. Um, there were Roman pagan gods, all sorts of that sort of thing. Um, Gnosticism was starting to give birth in that time too, which was, you know, you had to have secret knowledge to really be saved. So all of these things, Paul is worried about them adding those on to being a good Christian. And he's, what's Paul saying? What's he saying about that? He's saying, no, the only thing you have to have is what? What is it, the one thing that you have to believe? That Jesus in Christ crucified, right? That's, that's Paul's big thing. Nothing else matters. And that's what he's going through in this letter here. What are, some of the, what are some of the things in this uh, passage that you like? What did you like about this passage? Anybody? <laughs> Our enthusiastic crowd here. Okay, well, let's think about it. Justin's going to save me. All right, come on, Justin. I... I um... I like the fact that uh, when we receive Christ, that, that Christ is in us, and it's, it's not like you have to do anything to earn that, right? It's a, it's a free gift given to us, and all of our actions then are in response to that gift of God's love in Christ Jesus. And so um, I, the circumcision language always... Struggle. I struggle with that just as a guy. Um, uh, <laughs> but um, the spiritual circumcision, I think, is an interesting thing to think about of what, what do I need to, um, for lack of a better word, cut away from yes. my life yeah. that is getting in the way of me receiving Christ? Um, or what am I adding in thinking, well, if I, if I just did this better, then I would have a, a better favor in God's eyes, right? And and all of that is just not proper theology or thinking. Yeah. It's, it's really finding freedom in the fact that God loves me, loves us, and all that we do. So being here for worship, um, uh, doing the mission work that we do, the Sidewalk Saturday work that we do, all of that is not to earn salvation, but it's in response to salvation already given. And, and so I think that's just a... A beautiful reassuring thing and and there's always stuff that needs to be purged from my life that gets in the way of of understanding that yeah i i thought that was a good a, a good verse that he put that uh or sentence that paul put in here about circumcision and spiritual circumcision and what that what that means what is i i, I found this interesting and i wondered if you did too what does paul say about the identity of jesus in this letter See if you can find that, and somebody raise their hand if they find it. 
This is a great theological statement. What does Paul say about the identity of Jesus? Let's look at verses uh, 9 and 10. He says this, For in Jesus the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him. So let's parse that a little bit. What does he mean by the whole deity of, uh, becomes bodily in Jesus? Hmm? Anybody? Yeah. Was he uh, part human and part God? No. He was what? Fully human and fully God, right? In him, um, fullness of deity, and you have come to fullness of him, in him. What does that mean? What does it mean that we have come to fullness in him? We have become... Right, but we have been made whole, complete, forgiven, the way God wants us to, to be, in, through Jesus. Not on our own. We couldn't do it on our own, but we did it through him. Um, who is the head of every ruler and authority? Paul's making a real statement there about who Jesus is, isn't he? in that particular climate, in that particular place where people had other rulers and others in authority that they thought were over them. And Jesus is made, and Paul's making a real statement about who is really the head of all. So you don't have to follow the philosophies and the empty deceits of that particular culture. You follow Jesus. What, did it, what in this passage bothered you? Did something in here bother you? Well, as we said before, as I was saying that, you know, Paul's warning against uh, new ideas, new powers and authorities that might be coming into these new Christians. I want you to think a little bit about what that might mean, what, what steps uh, that we can take uh, to not be captured by false ideas. And is that a problem for us to be captured by false ideas and, and ideologies? And what can we do to avoid that? Because it can happen subtly, right? Anybody have any ideas, any examples of that uh, that you've seen or that you've had to work out in your own life? Scott? I think, I think all the time, I think humans uh, love to make idols. We can make idols out of anything, baseball, whatever uh, you can think of. And we get fooled by a lot of things. I, I can't tell you how many uh, diet fads I've, uh, I've tried thinking, this is the miracle that I've been looking for, <laughs> right? And we fall for everything under, under the, the yeah. sun. Uh, so I love that part where he's, he's saying, don't be taken captive because I've been bound up by a lot of those things. Dude, I, some, there are some, some Christian... Um, denominations and things that want to add things to the gospel to make sure that you believe right, that's still a problem, right? And this is what Paul was fighting back then. People were trying to add things to the simple gospel that Jesus Christ crucified. Have faith in that and you will be saved. Um, but still we have that in our own time, that people are adding things to that. You need to do this. You need to believe that. You need to follow this. You need to do that to be uh, saved. Amy? Well, this is one problem that I had going from the Lutheran Church to the Episcopal Church, uh, the three-legged stool. And um, you know the tradition and reason. 
And I realized how dangerous tradition can be. Uh, and it's, it's like an adding on, adding on. Uh, so tradition in that way, you know, and reason, I mean, you can reason yourself or say it's reasoning into any corner. Uh, so I'm, I've been a, a scripture only <laughs> person all my life. But anyway, uh, I, I, there's a danger in there. Yeah, sure it is. If you're using the wrong tradition, you know, there's lots of traditions we've got in this church that aren't great. Um, and if you're, if you're, uh, if you're uh, uh, not reading scripture accurately, if you're pulling the things out that you like, and reason is, is also a very subtle thing because when um, uh, we were, you know, this scripture tradition of reason was first brought about, it, reason was not individual reason. It was the collective reasoning of the body of Christ. So when we can make a big mistake when we just put it on our own. Somebody else have something to say? Yes, please. I was just, just going to add that, you know, it looks like there's nothing new again under the sun and avoid clickbait and the self-help aisle in any bookstore. Because those, those are the pagan deceits of today, very much so. Great, thank you. Um, what does this passage tell us about God? What does it tell us about God? What's Paul trying to tell us about God and God through Jesus? Well, he first makes that statement that we just talked about, about, you know, um, the identity of Jesus, fully human, fully divine. But also, what does it tell? Amy, go ahead. Come on. Don't feel shy. Um, yeah, what, is, what does this tell us about God? Well, it tells us, uh, it tells us that God did this for us. I mean, we, um, we were just here. Yep, that God does this for us. There's nothing we can do to earn our own salvation. God does this spiritual circumcision if we allow him to do that, to cut away those things that separate us from God, those things that you know we have done in our lives that we know are wrong. He cuts those away and brings us to himself uh, as a new person. Um, what do we think of, you know, let's see what else we can talk about. Um, what's our next? I think, yeah. sorry, I have a mic on, so I, I th also think that there's a lot of echoes that come from the Old Testament, right? The circumcision and the baptism stuff, it just, they, they just don't pop up out of the blue in, in Paul's head. Yeah. And so there's this view that God has always been working in the, the Old Testament, the prophets and Moses and all that. Uh, there are echoes of that, that God is, has always been active and is, is fulfilling everything now in his son. Um, and the other one I want to ask, ask you, John, is what does it mean when he says he disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them? What does that mean? What verse is that? Oh, the last verse. Well, what happens when um, Jesus is crucified and resurrected and now we hold him up as the king of the universe now? What does that do to those rulers and authorities? Um, if, if we are honest and we live our religion the way we should, our, our faith the way we should, um, it takes away their power over us. Uh, you know, we, we give them, if they're good rulers and authorities, we give them the honor they're due, but they have no power over us. Only Christ has power over us. Um, that's what I think it is. Maybe Justin has a better answer. Yeah. I, don't, uh, I don't 
think I have a better answer, but I have a... Um, it, it's a concern or it's a challenge to us that um, I don't know if we've ever seen a ruler or authority who uh, is perfectly following Christ Jesus. <laughs> and so um, when, when you said that it disarms them so that they, they have no authority, I um, jokingly said to Avery, yeah, they, they double down. I think some yeah, of our rulers right. who have ruled throughout of history, they double down on their authority yeah. and their dictatorship um, uh, to kind of try to consolidate power instead of really relinquishing it and then gaining it, right? Through the relinquishing and giving it up to Christ, they're going to gain power and authority, um, but it will be a humble power and authority. And so it's, it's, um, it's interesting to, to think about where... Um, you know, I just traveled in countries that have been had a history of being um, uh, ruled by someone outside of their yeah. flock, right? They, yeah. you know, whether it be Hitler or the Bavarian Empire or the Ottoman Empire or whatever, and um, and with everyone that we talked to along our journeys um, through Germany and Austria, Hungary and uh, Slovenia or Slovakia. Um, there's this fear that what Russia is doing right now could sweep across the West and, and they could take, be taken over um, because they have a history of that. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's just that whole notion that rulers and authorities would be leading from a, a Christ Jesus love and humility um, it's hard to see that in today's world. Yeah. Um, so then that begs the question, well, what do we do about that, right? And so we, we have to be looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, in our leadership within our circles and our spheres of influence, are we leading from a godly perspective or are we leading to consolidate our own power and our own authority as well? That's and great. so, um, yeah. but it's, that's a challenge. I, yeah. And you know, a, a good challenge, but it's a challenge to see that yeah. in reality in our, our world today. Avery? I also think on the topic of disarming, uh, it talks, like we said, disarming rulers and authorities. Uh, they do the worst thing they can do to him, right, which is crucify him and, and kill him, and that doesn't stop him. No. Uh, that's a pretty bold statement in and yeah. of itself, right? And, and yeah. Paul, I think, understands that. I think that's why Paul's able to do what he does is because they say, well, what are, are they going to kill me? Like I, that, that didn't work for the last guy. Um, <laughs> so what are you going to do to me? And I think that that allows you to operate from a different yeah. place. That yeah. if, you, cause if, if the rulers and the authorities can't kill you, what can they do to you? That's, yeah. that's it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Thanks Avery. Is it, if we end up, we're not going to finish all the questions, but I wanted to read to you, um, what Eugene Peterson wrote on here. I just think it's great. I, I read this last night and thought if you're going to do a summary of what this said, he does, does a great job. So as we end up, let me just read this for you. And you can follow along and see how good he does uh, with what it says in the, in the translation. He says, he says uh, my counsel to you, Paul's counsel to you, is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You received Christ Jesus, the master. Now live him. You're deeply rooted in him. You're well constructed upon him. You know your way around the faith. Now do what you've been taught. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start living it. And let your living spill over into thanksgiving. Watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. They want to drag you off into endless arguments that never amount to anything. They spread their ideas through the empty traditions of human beings and the empty superstitions of spirit beings. But that's not the way of Christ. Everything of God gets expressed in him so you can see and hear him clearly. You don't need a telescope, a microscope, or horoscope 
to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the universe without him. When you come to him, that fullness comes together for you. His power extends over everything. Entering into this fullness is not something you figure out or achieve. It's not a matter of being circumcised or keeping a long list of laws. No, you're already in. Insiders, not through some secretive initiation rite, but rather through what Christ has already gone through for you, destroying the power of sin. If it's an initiation ritual you're after, you've already been through it by submitting to baptism. Going under the water was a burial of your old life. Coming up out of it was a resurrection. God raising you from the dead as he did Christ. When you were stuck in your old sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive, right along with Christ. Think of it, all sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, and the old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants of the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. So, we'll end with that.